Welcome, Nova family. Well, we find ourselves in a unique set of circumstances. We have, for the last few weeks, as we've walked through this experience of following the news about the coronavirus, and then having that epidemic slowly creep to the United States, and then finally, having it actually impact our own community. The most concrete impact that our household has experienced, besides searching for a good package of toilet paper, it came last week when our local schools put out the word that kids were to be kept at home for some two to three weeks and now almost indefinitely. That began this explosion on the internet with parents most concerned about what were they gonna do with all these lively bodies at home? How will we keep them entertained? How will we answer all of their academic questions? How will we keep them from killing each other? How will we not go absolutely nuts having our children around 24 seven? And then the online community, it began to chime in with suggestions. Other parents gave a glimpse into their home lives. Some parents were putting their kids on a strict schedule from waking to sleeping. Some parents were breaking all of their screen time limits for their kids so that they could preserve their own sanity. Others had a raft of online resources for education. Still others suggested you know, taking virtual tours at these museums. And through it all, from our own homes, through the internet, we got to peer into the daily lives of the families of our friends. What they thought good parenting was their attitude towards spending vast amount of time with their kids, the behavior of their kids, and what amount of self-control they did or didn't have. And so this coronavirus pandemic inadvertently amplified for all families this question, how are we parenting? Are we parenting rightly? Which is just a corollary of the concern of, is my family normal? Or what ought my family and its family life look like? What's the standard? Do my family relationships look more like those of uh, you know, the Brady Bunch? Or are we more like the Simpsons? Are we more like the Waltons? Or are we more like <laughs> the Sopranos? And it doesn't matter if we have infants or younger kids or adult kids, we have all been children of our parents. Some of us are parenting both uh, downward and upwards. We struggle with family, both biological and extended, and the family that God has brought into our lives as perhaps surrogate parents or mentors over us or people that we parent. And this week, as Nova returns to study the book of Ephesians, to kind of reclaim the sense of a new normal as we we're physically apart for this season, this is precisely the topic that the Apostle Paul is addressing. In light of what Christ has done in our lives and how he is working now, what ought our family life look like? What are God's standards for family and why? And so if you've got your Bibles there in your living rooms or your Nova apps open at home, you can follow along with us or you can follow our reading here up on your screen as we turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Here Paul writes the Ephesians, and he instructs them very simply. And he says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this is Paul's brief instruction to us about family life. But Paul's instructions to us about family life don't come to us in a vacuum. And so first, we want to remind ourselves of the big picture of the book of Ephesians that leads to our passage today. And the big picture is going to include both the purpose of Paul's writing and the principle behind these commands to both children and to parents. And if you've been with us in our study in the book of Ephesians, then you're familiar with the purpose of Paul's writing. Paul is writing this singular purpose that God's people would be one. This is why we've titled our series in the book of Ephesians, One. We've emphasized the fact that the theme of the book of Ephesians is that we all, fellow believers in the corporate body of Christ, we most glorify God through showing off the quality of unity, of oneness. 
Paul reminds us of this, this purpose in Ephesians chapter 4, when he asked the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And then he goes on in the third verse of that chapter to tell us that walking in a manner worthy is being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Preserving the unity of the Spirit. Simply, since our God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is three persons, but united and one, we reflect God when we individuals put down our selfishness. And instead, we live in love, and we live in harmony, and we live in unity with one another. So that's the purpose of Paul's letter, to help the Ephesians better glorify and better reflect God by instructing them in how to live as one. And Paul instructs us in living as one for a chapter and a half, starting in Ephesians chapter 4. But then Paul kind of turns a corner, and in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul begins a totally different tack and begins to teach the Ephesians the principle behind how specific, specific relationships in their lives can model that unity that God asks of us. He begins this section in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, saying, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Or as some translations word it, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the singular principle that helps us to preserve the unity of the Spirit. We are to mutually submit ourselves to one another. We are to put ourselves aside and put one another ahead of ourselves. And from that point on, Paul addresses every single relationship, every significant relationship that we might encounter in life and what it means to mutually submit to one another in that context. Husbands and wives, employers and employees, and here, children and parents. And so when we look at our passage today, these instructions are far more than just good advice from the Apostle Paul, far more than a simple group of commands to follow. Paul is showing us this is how our family relationships should look like as we mutually submit to one another so that we can show the world who God is through our families. And we don't just glorify God through our, just our own love and compassion and goodness toward people, but as a unit, the relationships in our family can show off and glorify the love and the harmony and the unity we find in God. So, Easy. Now we can look at our four verses from today. And Paul has only two audiences, children and parents. First to children, Paul's command is to both obey and honor. Obey and honor. First, obey. Here in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Or more clearly, for this is righteous. And this means for children, this is not in the relationship, relational sense, but in the sense of age, uh, children versus adults. We're all children of our parents, but this is addressed to young people, youth, you might say. So if you are young, uh, then you're still under the instruction or you're still under the same roof, under the support of your parents. Paul says submitting to one another then means obey. Obey your parents. If you are an elementary or a junior high or a high school student, perhaps as a college student, if your parents are supporting you, maybe if you're a college student and living at home still, we are to obey our parents because it's the righteous thing to do. That is the role that young people are to fulfill in submitting to one another in the context of family. Following the rules of your house, submitting to the wisdom of your parents, doing what is asked of you. That's the first dimension of our command to children, obey. The second is a command not so much addressing behavior as it addresses attitude. Paul asks children, beyond obedience, honor. Honor your father and mother, which is not, if you look in the Old Testament, it's not the first commandment in the list of the Ten Commandments. And it's not the first command that comes out with a promise within the Old Testament. We can better translate this as, which is a commandment of great priority so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That is children of our parents. We're to not only obey, but internally have an attitude of giving honor, respecting, uh, giving deference to our parents. 
And this is for all children of their parents at every age and every stage. We are meant to honor our parents. This can be seen as the greater overarching command that applies to us all. Because honoring our parents is it's wise. There's some wisdom in it. This is what the book of Proverbs com communicates throughout its teaching. That the general rule is that our parents, being older, being more experienced, eh, they know some things. Many things that we don't. And this is why the teachers of the book of Proverbs, well, they're parents. From the very first chapter of Proverbs, Solomon says in uh, Proverbs 1.8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. The more parents were honored, the greater a person's chance for a long and stress-free and happy life through the wisdom of their parents. As we honor our parents, we show a kind of necessary and basic humility. It's so important in life. A kind of self-awareness that we aren't always in the right. And even if we are in the right, in certain circumstances, we can be right in a humble and respectful way toward others. This is why Paul adds, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Honoring our parents gives to us certain character qualities that bless every part of our relationships. So when we're young children in our parents' homes, honoring parents is shown through obedience. When we're a little bit older, honoring parents is cherishing the wisdom of our parents. It's taking their opinion seriously. Maybe not obeying every wish or rule that they might have, but seeing why they believe what they believe and listening. And then as we know, from Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, that honoring our parents as they get older is making sure that they're provided for in their old age. That even spiritual-sounding priorities aren't nearly as important as showing that we care for our parents and we plan for their needs and we help parent them. This is the first audience that Paul addresses. All of us as children. The second is to those who are parents, and that is to raise our children in Christ. Raise our children in Christ. Paul has this one verse for parents, and we have to remember that this verse encapsulates what it means that we submit to even our children in the Lord. How do parents serve their children and put their kids best as a priority over their own desires? Paul says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Presumably, Paul is addressing mothers as well, and he's listed fathers as the representatives of the parenting team, much like the Old Testament often addresses fathers in instructing parents in raising children. And Paul asked this of parents, don't provoke your kids to anger. The New International Version has this wonderfully illustrative translation, don't exasperate your children. Well, that begs the question, what does that mean? And commentary after commentary and website after website has lists upon lists of what this means to provoke your children to anger. Uh, being too lax, being too stern, being angry, showing anger at one's spouse, letting your children interrupt you or not letting your children interrupt you, not spending enough time with your kids or letting your kids control you, not being consistent, not being flexible. But the answer is right here, right here in this verse. Paul says, don't provoke your children to anger but do this, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That if we want to safeguard our children from being provoked by us to anger, we need to teach them, we need to bring them up, nurture them in the discipline and instruction of Jesus. Which, sure, includes ethical lessons, theology, a worldview from the Christian perspective through the word of God. But beyond just rules and principles, Bringing up children in Jesus' discipline and instruction is to raise them as Jesus would, to be models of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' character and his self-sacrifice, who, if he were to teach our children, would exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He was all of these things when he was on the earth in regard to his disciples. These are the disciples who never seemed to understand anything that Jesus was trying to teach them. 
who didn't understand his power, didn't understand his purpose, didn't understand the most rudimentary principles about who he was and what he was trying to teach them all the way to the cross. Jesus says over and over, do you still not understand? And yet, he's patient with his disciples because spiritually their understanding is like that of children. They just, they're not there at the point where they can understand. And so they ask him over and over and over and over again, and he teaches them over and over and over again. That's what it means to not provoke our children to anger, to nurture them as, as Jesus nurtures us with patience and gentleness, understanding. So simple commands to families, but a couple of important observations we can note because of the simplicity of these verses. First, that these verses supply a personal picture to strive for that each of us in our respective roles as children or parents, or older children, or even as aunts, uncles, people in authority, or teachers, or kids, we all have a role in the larger task of submitting to one another. Whether it's honoring, or obeying, or nurturing, or teaching, each of these tell us that we need to put down our natural impulses and be Christ, sometimes in the hardest of our relationships. Those, admittedly, sometimes are our family relationships. The second observation is that these commands are not conditional. That it isn't children obey your parents or honor your parents if your parents don't exasperate you. And on the other hand, similarly, it doesn't say parents bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord if they're all agreeable angels and listen to you all of the time. Both of these exhortations are to their respective audiences to carry out Without, with, without regard to whether or not the other party responds. We're responsible in the role that God has placed us. And in no way are these verses to be weaponized against the other party. Once we do that, we're not fulfilling the command given to us at all. So we each are to embrace the role and command that Paul gives as we submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus. Now, two applications that are pretty obvious as we hunker down in our homes this week. The first is to see the greater motivation. See the greater motivation. And yes, we see the commands that God gives to us as children and as adult children and as parents to obey and honor and bring up our children as Christ would. But we need to see these instructions clearly in their context that they're given so that they have the meaning and application that they're meant to have. We're not supposed to toil at these commands as a heavy burden, but to understand that they are part of a larger piece of who we are and who we're becoming every day. People who are learning to be more like Jesus. And to be more like Jesus and to exhibit more of Jesus in our character means daily learning how to deny ourselves by submitting to people around us. And the people who are around us the most, well, usually that's our family. That's the bigger story, that each time that we are gentle with our children, every time we seek to understand our elderly parents and give them a patient answer, every time we do what our moms and dads say, even though we'd rather be doing something more fun or enjoyable, we're helping our family do the work of God's kingdom. We're glorifying God through preserving the unity of our family relationships. That's the bigger story. Uh, last week, Right before all of this COVID-19 news got serious, I actually was already video conferencing. And the one video conference that I had last week was, um, well, to admit it, I was applying to, to be on a game show. It's this new show that hasn't aired yet. Uh, I can't tell you about it. But I suppose they wanted to video conference with me to see how excited I could be on camera. Uh, they want contestants with a, a little bit of life in them but they were also interviewing me to get to know me as a contestant. They asked me all the normal stuff, occupation, age, how many kids you got, where you lived, but then they started probing around this one topic. Why do you want to be on our game show? Which was really kind of the same question of why do you want to win our game show? And obviously the right answer was, was not because I want to win a lot of money. That was obviously what happens on the game show when you go on a game show. But what the producers wanted to know was, beyond the money, what would the money do in your life? What would winning do in your life? They wanted the larger story of, are you having a hard time 
making the rent for next month? Are you a veteran who is supporting his ailing mother? Did you recently beat some deadly disease and this would be an added victory in your life? Is there a sick child out there somewhere who would be encouraged by your winning? You know how these TV shows are. They, they want a story. They were looking for the bigger meaning, the larger narrative of why winning would be so important. And we need to remind ourselves that obeying and honoring or raising our children as Christ would is part of a larger story. How we are in these relationships shows the world the very nature of our God glorifies God by showing how we are Jesus' love to one another in our everyday, moment to moment, these interactions of submission and selflessness. So first, we are to see the greater motivation. And then finally, we are to follow the greater model. Follow the greater model. And that is, of course, the model of Jesus. That in our being children and in our being parents, there are so many examples, so much advice, so much static that surrounds us. We began asking uh, today, who are our family relationships more like? And there's a parade of TV families that we think of when we think of possibilities. You know, the Simpsons, the Camdens, the Waltons, the Johnsons, the Cleavers, the Pearsons, even the Munsters. We might daily compare our parenting to that of our own moms or our dads or to the parenting of our neighbors or our friends. Or as children, we compare our households and what they get or what rules they follow to what we get and what we get to do or we don't get to do. Growing up, my, my great desire was that my parents would be a lot gentler, like uh, you know that, that Bill Bixby character in The Courtship of Eddie's Father, or that they would be as reasonable as Mike and Carol Brady. In our interior life, we all have a picture of what parenting or family life ought to be. But the encouragement here is to instead look to Jesus as our model. Look to Jesus as a model of obedience as children. Jesus endured great injustices. He, he endured great unfairness as he went to the cross. And he sacrificed himself for our benefit in obedience. And his parents looked to Jesus as a teacher and a leader who welcomed his disciples, saying that as they learned from him, remember Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, he would be gentle and humble in heart, and in learning from him that they would find rest for their souls. This is the call of Jesus as we daily interact with one another in our homes, even as we get this super concentrated experience inside our households for these weeks indoors. Be Jesus to one another. Yield to one another. And in so doing, show our community the supernatural love that God works in us as we reflect the example of Christ.